One of the most intriguing sessions in the whole Congress is the one that's titled Cures for Diabetes? Question mark. We've heard about uh, the use of gene therapy as a potential cure. Now we're going to hear about immunotherapy. And I'm very pleased that Colin Diane from uh, University of Cardiff has joined us. And our immunotherapy is the wonder uh, sort of dr drug of uh, cancer. But can it be applied to diabetes? Well, of course it can. And in fact, it's the strange thing that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. The treatment is immunotherapy, not insulin. We've had insulin for nearly 100 years and we haven't thought of anything else. Whereas in all the other autoimmune diseases, they don't have a replacement therapy in inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis. So they actually treat the immune system. And it's about time we did that in type 1 diabetes. And do you think it's been because we have insulin that we really haven't looked more closely at yes. immunotherapy? Yes, for, insulin for is good, one. but it's hidden us from the reality. And one of the things I'll be talking about is to say that I think we need to wake up as clinicians and healthcare professionals to how bad type 1 diabetes is. Um, one of my colleagues had a, her daughter diagnosed at the age of 13 and she said she cried for a year because she knew what it meant. And the people with type 1 diabetes live with this for years and years and years. It's a huge burden for them and for their families. And we say, just take the insulin. Now, are there any specific treatments that are already, if you like, on the shelf? Or do we need to uh, think about something much more specific for diabetes? Well, th there are two streams. I think the first important thing to say is that when we talk about immunotherapy, we don't mean cyclosporin, we don't mean anti-rejection drugs, we don't mean the things people thought about in the 1980s that gave you opportunistic infections. Uh, we talk about the modern biologics, which all of the diseases I mentioned are now using. It's routine practice in, in all of those conditions, even in psoriasis. There are six licensed therapies uh, which are biologics and are available. And have, has anybody tried those biologics in diabetes? Because well, they, presumably there are people with um, those conditions who might also have diabetes. There are. There are relatively few. It's hard to do a clinical trial of people who have two diseases at the same time. So... And people are beginning to do those things. Uh, I think the extra challenge in type 1 diabetes is we were kind of told, and people were kind of challenged with a cure. And none of the other autoimmune conditions, you take your immunotherapy once and that's the end of it. Uh, but the idea was that somehow we had to cure people and that made the bar even higher. So many of those are now being used. Uh, for example, abatacept is routinely, it's licensed for use in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It has been used in type 1 diabetes. But what we find is that the companies don't want to license it for type 1 diabetes and we're the bottom of the pile when they come to testing them out. Why is that? Well, that's because, uh, for many reasons, I think partly because the healthcare professionals haven't asked for it and we don't understand immunology in generally. Diabetologists don't understand immunology. Uh, can I just say that many people don't understand well, immunology? It seems to be a... It, it, it's, its lexicon is extraordinary, and it's, it's a whole collection of acronyms. Yes, but almost all the other specialties have had to learn their immunology and their immunotherapy, and we haven't had to do that. And that's reflected in companies where the cardiometabolic arm is very distant from the immunotherapeutic and cancer arm and they don't talk to each other. So the immunotherapy divisions don't understand about glucose and the cardiometabolic arms don't understand all the assets that these big companies have that would be beneficial in type 1 diabetes. So it's been a slow process. And also the trials take a bit longer than they would, for example, in psoriasis because the endpoint is not so straightforward. And finally, the treatment has to be given at diagnosis. And at diagnosis is the easiest time in type 1 diabetes. It's a big shock. But because you still have beta cell function, glycemic control is relatively easy. But it's not going to be like that in years to come. And it's a difficult conversation sometimes to have with patients, uh, especially those where there isn't a family with type 1 diabetes, to say, it's OK now, but it's going to change. Now, we've heard so much about immunotherapy because of oncology and it being the wonder approach in cancer treatment. Now, there, the approach is very much to use immunotherapy to make the cancer obvious to the immune system. Can a similar kind of approach be used for diabetes? Absolutely. And 
of course, the opposite approach. Yes. We need to learn from the cancers. They're very clever at avoiding the immune system and slowing the attack. And the recent Nobel Prize that's just been awarded and the immune checkpoint inhibitors have really demonstrated that. And it's really interesting that for the first time, those immune checkpoint inhibitors have triggered type 1 diabetes. So we're beginning to see patients treated for cancer who develop type 1 diabetes within a month. How so that's an aggressive immune release. So it's exactly what you say. What we need to do is the opposite, and we need to learn those tricks and reverse them. And how long do you see for a time frame for that kind of thing happening? Well, there are drugs available now, uh, and the phase three studies are happening now. It's a matter of the will to implement them. A batacept, as I mentioned, is available. You can prescribe it. We're doing a trial with a, another treatment, askatinumab, for, for, um, that's licensed for psoriasis. They're all available. It's the will of the companies, and most importantly, I think, of the community to say, we need this. There's nothing like your own beta cells. If you have just a few of your own beta cells, you don't have hypoglycemia, you hardly need to test, your HbA1c will be perfect, and life will be very easy. But as soon as you lose those last 5 to 10% of your beta cells, it's like sailing on the Atlantic Ocean and your blood sugars are all over the place and you need lots of kit to, to bring that back. And for the teenagers, which is the commonest time to be diagnosed, it's a huge problem and many of them don't take their insulin and get into trouble as a result of that. If they had their own beta cells, just for a few years even, it would make life so much easier at that difficult time of life. Fascinating. And I suspect there may be a tipping point because we saw it with immunotherapy for cancer. There were some very difficult uh, trials at the very beginning. And then suddenly we reach a tipping point where everybody piled into immunotherapy. And now there's a huge amount of research, huge amount of money being ploughed into uh, the field. I, I could the same happen with diabetes? I could not agree more. I think once the first drug is licensed for immunotherapy, once you know that when a newly diagnosed patient is diagnosed, the urgency is not just learning insulin, it's stopping the last of those beta cells being lost and you've got a therapy to do it, then people will realize the huge benefits of doing that. Uh, and then I think many other therapies of which there are many waiting to come online will happen. And there's one more thing that we can do in diabetes that many of the other diseases can't. We can predict pretty accurately everyone who's going to get type 1 diabetes many years before they do. And that means we can prevent it. That means we can make it a disease of the past uh, if we can intervene at that stage. And how would you see doing that? So that's the more speculative approaches, what's called antigen-specific therapies. And so they're not about damping one part of the immune system down selectively, which is what we currently do, but it's about boosting that tolerance, I think, that you're referring to, that protection that the beta cells normally have in patients who don't develop type 1 diabetes. If you think about those immune checkpoint inhibitor patients, they'd done fine for 50 years until we released the immune system. They were protecting their beta cells even though they had the potential to attack them. So we're finding ways of giving the antigens back from the pancreas in an environment that promotes tolerance. It's the holy grail, but it, in that sense, it would be the way to do it. It's, if you like, an unvaccine. It protects you uh, rather than vaccinates you against your own self-antigens. Fantastic. So there you heard it, an unvaccine for diabetes. Uh, fascinating area. And yes, uh, immunology is possibly the most difficult of medical specialties to get into. But I absolutely agree with you, Colin. I think that's where it's going. You can find Colin Dian's presentation on easd.org in full. And I do urge you to watch it. Fascinating stuff.